Hi, this is Pastor Phil McKinney, Senior Pastor of Believer's Christian Church. We're so excited to sow this message into your life. We pray that the Holy Spirit would minister to you, bring revelation to your heart, and make lasting change for the good. All right, this morning I'm going to continue on the series that I began last week on It Is Finished. And this is part two of It's Finished, and it's entitled Power and Authority. Now last week, I, I, I believe we did really good on establishing that salvation was purchased by one sacrifice in Jesus. So if I ask anybody this morning, is Jesus dying on the cross anymore? No, the answer is no, he's not. He died one time for all sin, right? So we call it the finished work because it is finished when he died and rose from the grave. But in that finished work, salvation was the ground level, the foundation, if you will, the structure by which we can now be established in the kingdom of God. Now, the first step I want to talk about is power and authority. And what I plan to do this morning is go from creation all the way through through Jesus and then today. And what I want to establish is that it was God's original design that we walk in both power and authority. It was robbed from us because of the fall. But Jesus, by by the purchasing it back on the cross, has given it to us as an inheritance. We have often lived in church culture as just weak, anemic, uh, very uh, passive people. I mean, just look at Hollywood. Look how they portray the, the, the reverend or the priest that shows up when something demonic is happening. You got the, the wimpy guy who's shaking at the knees and holding up a cross, getting brutalized or beat up by something that's demonic. Okay, so we have established a culture of ministers or Christians as just being weaklings. They get beat up on, have no authority at all. All right, so God's original plan. I'm going to take it back to creation in Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at verse verse number 28. It says that God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. He says, Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, one part I didn't point out is that this is the sixth day. God had done all of the creating he was going to do. He has now fashioned Adam and said, I'm giving you dominion. I'm giving you the authority over the earth. Now let's go a little bit uh, further ahead in the same chapter in verse 15. It says, Then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it or keep it. So he took him off to the east part of the the area called Eden, and he he gave him dominion to keep it and have authority over it. So... Now, let's, let's go a little bit further yet, even, and uh, see how the Lord gave Moses even, or Moses, Adam even more authority. I'm getting ahead of my notes. So let's look at verse 19. It says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, the, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. So can you imagine this, that God positions Adam in a such a way that he begins to file through all of these animals. And he begins to name them off, and it says in the final part of this verse, of this passage, that even though he was naming both male and female uh, animals, and how do we know that? Because they're still here today. Okay, the, the process of reproduction. As he looked across, he didn't see one that was similar to him. But one point I'd like to say here is that while Adam had been given the authority to name everything, in that same way, God was also submitting to that. If you think about it, he he gave Adam the authority to name it, and God just said, I'm going to go along with what you name it, Adam. Now, if you look at this in such a way, I'm I'm not trying to imply that Adam is is greater than God or God ever submits to man, but in in a relationship that you might think of husband and a wife. There are plenty of times that be, in my marriage relationship that I'll submit to my wife's idea, her leading, her guiding on things. Now, yes, I'm the head of the home. I'm the priest of my home. But there's a marriage relationship. So you see, it's a picture of relationship that God had originally designed Adam and Eve to have authority. And so as he's naming them off, he, he says, whatever you name them, Adam, that's what it's going to be. Now, they have this authority. And due to the fall, they literally handed over this authority to Satan. He didn't come and steal it. He tricked them. He deceived them. And when they fell, they handed over that authority. 
Now, most of us have been taught something to the level of uh, that God was so furious with Adam and Eve that he just kicked him out of the garden and wouldn't have anything to do with him. Well, if you look at that verse in Genesis 3 where he says, I drove them out of the garden, the word drove there is the same word as expel. He removed them from the garden. And then he goes on to explain why. Because he says, they have become like us. And now if they eat from the tree of life in this fallen state, they'll live forever. You see, it was mercy that he removed them from the garden to get them away from that. Can you imagine living in a fallen state forever? We would have people like Hitler around, Stalin around, living forever under these conditions that we would never be escaped from. So in that death, a lifespan here on earth is really a blessing. But eventually, he did it so that we wouldn't have to stay in this state. But he also, as he was removing them, he prophesied to both Adam and Eve and was setting in motion a plan to fix this. And he said that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless her seed. And we know that he's speaking of Jesus. Last week, I established that the Old Covenant, the law, uh, most of what we see in the Old Testament is a shadow, a picture of what's to come. Just to give a verse on that, let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. He says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. Now, has anyone ever been to downtown Chicago or downtown New York City? It's quite a culture change for our farm community, right? One of the things that I thought was really uh, strange for me to get my head around is as you're driving down these streets, the buildings are so tall, and it looks like you're, you're going through a tunnel as you're downtown. Now, if you can imagine, um, if you're walking down the sidewalk of downtown Chicago, and you're coming to the edge of a building, and the sun is coming up on this side of the building, and I see someone approaching, I'm going to see the, the shadow of them cast in front of me. I'm going to see their shadow before I see the person. You with me? And so, is the shadow the substance of the person I'm about to see? No, the person that I'm about to see is going to come around the corner. This is what it's saying. This is a shadow, a broadcast, a, uh, of an image of what's to come. So as we look at some of these things, we'll keep in mind that we can pull out so much from the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and see how it was a shadow of things to come that you and I can relate to intimately. Okay? So let's go ahead about 1,500 years, and Moses speaks to, or God speaks to Moses. Now they're with the Israelites. They're in the... Uh, the desert, and they're wandering around. And God says, build for me a sanctuary. It's in Exodus 25, verse 8. It says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that's the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furnishings, just so you shall make it. A few verses ahead in verse 22. It says, and there I will meet with you. He goes on to say, I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony or covenant, above everything, which I will give you in the commandment to the children of Israel. You see what the, it's, we're seeing here is a picture of God's desire to have intimate encounter with his people, to have his presence everywhere they go. Now, I want to show you a diagram of what this modular tabernacle looked like. The reason it was modular is because everywhere they would go, they would tear it down, they would move and reset it up. You see a perimeter that was made of white linen. There's only one way into it on the, on the east gate. The first area that you would see is the outer court, the brazen altar, the, the brazen lavern, which is, looks like an oversized bird bath. The next part is the building. And when you come through that cloth is the holy place. And in the holy place, you found the showbread, 12 loaves. You found the lamp stand. It was one stand with seven different candles on it. And then you found the altar of incense, or it was called the altar of presence. Dividing the holy uh, place and the most holy place was a veil. This veil, I believe it was 72 different squares that were knitted together. It was 60 feet tall by 30 feet wide. And according to old uh, uh, original Jewish writings, it's, it's so somewhere between five and eight inches thick. In fact, it was so heavy, it's written that it took 300 priests to move it around, to deal with it. Twice a year, they would remake it so that because of the stains and the blood that would get on it. And so it would take 300 men to be able to maneuver this thing and move it from one location to the other, just to give an idea of how secure this Holy of Holies was. 
And in the Holy of Holies, he says, I want you to build it. And now on this ark, I'm going to dwell there, my presence, and I'm going to speak with you. And I'm going to command these things to you. There's a lot of symbolism. Go to the next image. You'll see this is the modular one. Later when Solomon uh, built his own, this is the beautiful temple that he built. This one was, was, uh, was going to be permanent, at least until 70 AD when it was destroyed. Again, you'll notice that there's only one gate, symbolizing there's only one way, which is Jesus. The first place was the brazen altar. And you'll notice that they use slopes. They actually called it a different term, but it's not, there's no steps there because it's indicating there are no steps to salvation. The next thing is the, the labyrinth, the water. It's a symbolization of the white washing of the word before you go into the holy place. In that holy place is where the presence is. Now, I'll, I'll stop there, but I want to give a little bit of explanation as we move forward. And I'm going to come back and, and tell you why we're including this in this journey of the finished work that we're entitling Power and Authority. So now let's fast forward again another 1,400 years or so. Now Jesus is on the scene. And one of the first things he does is he goes and begins to teach. And let's look at Mark chapter 1, verse 21. He says, uh, Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching before he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Now Jesus is our model. He's one that's full of grace and truth, and he's one that's full of power and authority. How many can agree with me this morning that Jesus was on a mission? He was sent by God on a mission. His mission was to destroy the works of the devil. But with any mission comes attached to it authority. Just to give a verse on, the, on this, I really want to just focus on the last part, but it's in fairness, I want to read the whole verse. First John 3, 8 says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That was his mission. So with the mission came the authority to do that mission. Are you with me? So Jesus now is uh, into his earthly ministry. He's coming over the hill, the River Jordan. And you know, that uh, familiar with the story, he's about to be water baptized. And when he does, the Spirit of the Lord comes and manifests like a dove and rests upon him. And immediately from that place, he's taken into the wilderness. And I want to I want to focus on the three things that he was tempted with. So let's look at it in Luke chapter 4. I'd like to read the first nine verses. I know I'm going fast. Please write these verses down for your own sake if you want to go back. Um, yeah, but I, I wanted to put them up here so we can get through this information. But don't just take this for it. Go back. Look at it. Make sure that I'm teaching in context. And, uh, and if you find that I'm wrong, you can come and help me out, okay? All right. Verse number one, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted 40 days by the devil. Uh, and those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when he had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for, for this has been delivered to me. I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. Okay, so the three things that, that Satan wanted to tempt him with was first, his natural carnal man. He'd been fasting for 40 days. So he tempted him with, with natural hunger. Turn these stones into bread. The second thing I want to point out here is that he tempted him with Jesus' authority. He says, If you worship me i'll give it to you now let's go back and see how satan said it in uh in the verses i just read he says all this authority i will give you this is satan speaking and their glory for this has been delivered to me and i give it to whoever i want remember because of the fall they willingly submitted to him they handed over authority and dominion over the earth he was right in saying i have authority to give to whoever i want so he tempted him by his authority and the third thing is that he attempted, he attempted to get Jesus or rob Jesus of his identity. 
if you are the Son of God. Now remember, he did the same tactic with the first Adam. Did God say? And then he said, you know that he only wants you to keep away from it because then you'll be like God. The truth is, they already were like God, but they bought into it. Well, the first Adam fell for it, the last Adam didn't. And so I like how Chris Bolton, uh, one of the ministers at Bethel Church, says this. He says, if the devil would have known what was going to happen when Jesus was crucified, he would have killed everyone that was trying to kill Jesus. He knew, if he would have known the, the power and authority, the deliverance that was coming through Jesus, he would have done everything he can to keep him alive. Right? So Jesus purchased this authority back. John the Revelator, uh, writing in the, the book of Revelation, and I, I want to point this out. I, I did it for the first service. If you turn to your, in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, You'll notice it's not Revelations. It's the book of Revelations. And what is it? Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of end times. Okay? I say that because everyone's got this spooky afraidness of the end times. That was not the purpose of this book. It was a revelation of Jesus Christ. So John begins to write of his very first experience in Revelations 1, Revelation 1.17. He says... And then when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and I'm the last. I am he who lives, who and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I hold or have the keys to Hades and death. Jesus purchased back this authority that was stolen or given over by Adam and Eve, and now he has these keys. But it's not the first time we see that Jesus actually prophesied about this to the Apostle Peter. Let's look at the next verse. In Matthew 16, 19, this is Jesus speaking. He says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be, or, or, uh, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He's prophesying of this, that I'm going to give you these keys of authority. Now, Jesus is getting ready to uh, his final words to the disciples. And if you'll look with me at Matthew 28, he purchased it back from Satan, and then he gave it to his disciples, which also we could say he gave it to us as an inheritance. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me on heaven, and on earth. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, that means all people groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now remember, Jesus was a man on a mission. And authority comes with a mission. And so now his mission, Jesus' mission, to destroy the works of the enemy, have become their mission. It's become our mission. And so they were co-missioned. They were given this authority to go out and trample upon every work of the enemy. How do we know, then, it was also for everyone else? Because in the previous verse that we just read, Jesus said, now go out and duplicate, teach, make disciples. That's what the word disciple means, to teach those what I've taught you. So he began to, to he commission them. He would never have sent them out on a mission without the authority to fulfill the mission they were on. I like how the Apostle Paul, depending on what version you read from, he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, for we are laborers together. Some versions say co-laborers, co-workers together with God. And we are God's husbandry, yet we are God's building. Or you, we are God's building. Now, Jesus was modeling this. Remember, under his, under his earthly uh, ministry, Jesus modeled what it looked like to be a man that's full of grace and truth, a man under power and authority. He gives us a demonstration in Luke 9. He, he says to his guys, he says, then, I called his, or then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over how many? All. I need to get some vocalization out of you guys this morning. Help me out all demons, and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to pray for the sick. Thank you. You guys caught that one. All right, so go a few verses ahead. He says in verse 6, So they departed, and they went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. 
Okay? He gave them the charge, and get this, they responded. They went and did the stuff. They went and preached the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's right before you. It's at reach. And then they went out and began to heal all those. Now, the difference here is I'd like to, I want to point out a few things. That Jesus spoke these words to him. How do you remember in John 1, uh, when it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who was the Word that became flesh? Jesus. So Jesus, now, he spoke these words to his men. He gave them authority. They now knew what to do. They went out and did it. Well, the difference under this, because you have to keep in mind that Jesus' earthly ministry was still under the law. It wasn't finished until he died on the cross and said, it is finished. And so under this condition, he spoke this authority over them. They went out and began to do what they uh, were called to do, commissioned to do, or sent out a mission to do. It could be said like this. The power was upon them, but it wasn't in them yet. Okay? Now, look, Jesus begins to minister to these guys about this fact. And he says in John sixteen seven, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Can you imagine if you're the disciples now? Now, you know the rest of the story. But if you're the disciples and Jesus tells you, you know what, guys? It's to your advantage that I go. And you're thinking, uh, no, it's not. Everything we do is because of you. I mean, when I use your name, people get healed and, and demons flee. That would be the furthest thing from my mind that it's to my advantage that you're no longer here. It says, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Of course, we know he's speaking about the Holy Spirit. Now let's go a little bit further. Verse 13. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Look at the next part. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? 1,400 years earlier, the Lord is speaking to Moses about building a sanctuary where he could dwell, meet with them, and speak with them. And now Jesus is saying, it's better that I go, that I send the Holy Spirit, because he will speak to you. He will speak to me. How many have been uh, traveled outside of the United States before? There's a few of you. So you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say, you know, it didn't matter which direction I was coming back into the States from. They always stopped me at immigration or at the, before I could come in, and they would ask me the same question every time. Do you have anything to declare? What were they asking? They were asking, am I bringing anything with me? Do I possess anything now with me that I need to declare? It's the same thing going on here. We now, he declares what the possessions that he has, and he declares them to us. They become our possessions. You see how that, how that works? It was God's desire, his design, that he wants to speak with us. He wants to know us. He wants to be intimately involved and have his presence near us. Now, Jesus is getting ready to take his final breath on the cross. And if we go back to the temple, you remember there was a division between the holy place, where the showbread, the, the lampstand, which I'll, I'll get into further detail, and then the altar of presence. But, and the other side of that was the manifest presence of God, and a veil separated it. In Mark, go to the next verse for me, Tim. In Mark 15, verse 37, And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. And when the veil of the temple was torn in, in two from top to bottom. Now, I don't know exactly what this thing weighed, but 60 by 30, 5 or 6 inches thick, 300 people, men, to be able to lift it and manipulate this thing, it was quite a, a, uh, an accomplishment. And you'll notice that even if someone could have somehow, with some type of mechanical assistant, rendered this thing, caught the veil, wouldn't it have been from the bottom to the top but it ripped from the top to bottom this is another imagery of god's desire from heaven to earth it was the kingdom of god being manifest on earth it was god's desire to rip this thing out and when he breathed his last the the presence of god the spirit of god was released and it shook the earth 
He, was, he had made provision that no longer does this thing have to be veiled, and there's a reason for this, that he now comes. Now, I made mention that Jesus talked about the fact, or in Luke 9, he sent out his men. Clearly, they had authority. Then he ministered to them in, in John 16, that it's better or to your advantage that I go, because if I don't go, I don't send the helper. Well, now here we are, here we are in Acts chapter 1, and Jesus is going to meet with them before he's about to literally descend into heaven before their eyes. In Acts 1, verse 4, he says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, speaking of his previous conversation. For John truly baptized with water, but you, sh- but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The word baptized literally means to immerse, to emerge or immerse. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put into his own authority. Verse 8, this is where I'm looking for. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you. You shall be, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This power now was going to be in them, not just upon them. Now, if we can go back to the, the tabernacle, just one more time, Tim, the original one, the modular one. Surrounding the outer court was a white linen, symbolizing the purity of Jesus. Only one entry, because there's only one entry into the kingdom, which is Jesus. The, the altar, the sacrifice once received, the laver, the, the, the water, the purifying of the word now coming into the holy place. The holy place had, had three things. It had the 12 loaves of bread symbolizing the 12 tribes because they couldn't be one body yet. It also had the lampstand, which was one singular lampstand to seven, accounting for the, 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 the divisions or denominations of, of the tribes. And then there was the, the altar or the, the incense where it was the priest's job to constantly keep that fire going and it was, the, it was known as the altar of presence. Now what divided those two was the veil. Once the veil was ripped, the, the glory was now available. The Holy Spirit was now available. The reason that we don't see very much power and authority in modern church or recent years or however we want to say it is because... Most, I believe, are living somewhere in the outer court. Sure, they've received Jesus as Savior. They've come into the gate. But they're not taking the whitewashing of the word and becoming more conscious of this presence. And so they they satisfied with just being in. In fact, for most Christians, the prize is really heaven. But that's not the prize. That's our destination. The prize is Christ. And now this presence is available to us Now there's only one bread. Who's the bread of life? Jesus. There's only one lampstand. You remember in the letters to the churches in Revelation, he says that I might remove their lampstand. There's just one lampstand. And now this presence is available. The more conscious we become of it, how do I become conscious of what's available to me? Jesus was the word become flesh. He spoke it to them. Now you and I need to read what these words are. I become more conscious of this presence. The more conscious I become of it, the more I begin to actively walk out this power and this authority. Now, the question that always gets asked of me, and maybe you've been asked too, is was this power limited to the apostles? You know, certainly because they were just, they were going out to build the early church. So let's ask, or let's look at what Jesus said about that. He says in Mark 16, and these signs will follow those who Oh, not just the apostles? Those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. What's the catch? What do we have to do? Believe. Okay? Let's look what Paul says to the church in Rome. Keep in mind, the church in Rome is still a pretty infant church at this point. He's not writing it to the leaders. He's writing it to the church. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies 
through his spirit who what? Dwells in you. Let's look at one more. Paul's uh, letter to the Corinthians. Again, to the church in Corinthians. We talked about them before. This was a basket case of a church. I mean, they had a mess everywhere. They were troubled in authority. They were troubled with sexual sins. They were everything that you can see in, in modern day churches, they were struggling with. And he tells them in, in his letter, the first letter to them in, in chapter 3, do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells within you. So it would appear to me that this message of it just being isolated to the apostles is not true. Okay, go back to the temple one more time. I want to bring this shadow into a reality of where we live. There's three, ver- there's three distinct areas within that temple. The goal was to have a dwelling place for the Spirit of God. If you look at the temple, and now you look at the temple where God dwells, there's a lot of similarity here. The outer court would represent our bodies. The holy place would be our soul. And the most holy place would be our spirit. The body it was, is, is neutral. The soul, the more you get your mind renewed, and I want to turn to a verse on that one, but as we get our mind renewed or become more conscious of his presence, the more materialized or manifest we see. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I don't know why the word prove was used to in the translation of this verse, but if you, if you go through your, for yourself and study the Greek origin of the word prove, it actually means allow. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind or your soul uh, that you might allow that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Allow the holy place, the holy place, getting this renewed. I'm getting it transformed. I'm becoming more conscious of this power. And now in my natural realm, my material realm, I'm seeing this power and authority manifest. Okay? One final. Kingdom of God defined simply. King's domain. The king's domain. Romans chapter 14, verse 17, my final verse. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, speaking of the law, but is righteousness and peace and joy. Where? In the Holy Spirit. Where's the Holy Spirit dwelling? Inside. The kingdom of God is dwelling within you and I. If the Holy Spirit's in you, we are the king's domain. We have to, we have to get a hold of this. It would be a false humility for you to act like there's no power within you to do anything. I get invited to hospitals, people's homes, different, different things to go pray for people, and I'm quick to respond. Not because I feel like I'm Superman in and of my own strength, my own flesh, but I'm quick to respond because I know the power that I carry. And I'm not isolated in this. As a believer... You, should, you need to understand that wherever you go, the king's domain goes with you. And we are to materialize this, uh, this authority by using it. You're not weakling some worms just hanging on with all you got until Jesus returns and we can go to heaven and we don't have any more struggles. You're not called, I'm not called to just make it. We're called to overcome. That's, that's on the offensive, not the defensive. I carry within me, you carry within me, within you, the kingdom of God, the king's domain, the very spirit that Jesus operated under, that rose him from the grave, is now dwelling in you and I. I can go into a circumstance with great courage, great confidence, and know that when I'm there, the kingdom of God is there. And I, it's not the time for me to show up. Let's say uh, Nick's in the hospital, and he calls for help. Is that the time for me to start exposing my insecurity? He doesn't need any more insecurity about any situation. What he needs is for me to manifest the confidence that I have in God. And I'm here to deliver it. It's important that it's not just a pastor thing. It's not just an apostle thing. It's not just back in the Bible times thing. It's right now. 
We're called to walk in this. It's finished. The return of the lost authority that was given to Adam was purchased back by the only one who could do it. And then he gave it to us as an inheritance. One final verse. I want you to stand with me. I read this in the last verse, and this is important. And I'd like you to, while you just close your eyes and just soak, soak this in. Paul writing to the church in Ephesus in, in this uh, chapter 1. And this is his prayer over them. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. When you receive Christ as Savior, you were, you were once a sinner by nature. Born again in Christ, you become a saint. Paul is saying, Lord, I'm praying that you would open their eyes. Give them revelation to see what is this inheritance. That I, I believe right now that, God, you're speaking to our hearts. That you're, you're reviving these things even with us that have been dormant. That you're opening our eyes and exposing that this is ours to use. And that with that power, with that authority, Lord, you've given us charge to go and destroy the works of the devil. We're not weak in you. We're more than conquerors in you. I thank you for revealing these things to us. They, be, they become foundations in us that when you said it is finished, you return back as an inheritance the authority and dominion for every believer, for each one that would receive. Father, help us to grow in this. We must live in a place of confidence. We must live in this place of authority and power. And Lord, we, just, we repent for false humility and we receive what you've given us, Lord, to walk this out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to continue this series next week, at least for one more week. And next week, I'm going to teach on healing. I asked this question at the beginning of the service. How is Jesus still dying for sin? He's not. He, he died one time, once for all, right? And was it at the moment that you got saved? Or was it 2,000 years ago? Okay. He paid for our salvation 2,000 years ago. You receive it by simple faith, responding to him, right? He also purchased this power and authority back that was handed over to Satan and has given it back to you and I. I'm going to show you very clearly, very clearly in Scripture, that healing also was paid for on the cross. And when you have a need for healing in your body or someone else's body, we don't have to pray, God, I need you to come do this, any more than I have to pray, Lord, I need you to come die on the cross again. Lord, I need you to die on the cross so I have authority to use it now. I can show it clearly that healing was purchased 2,000 years ago that you and I can now, as simple as we receive salvation, we can receive healing in our natural bodies. I know that this topic is a sensitive one. I'm going to do it delicately, and I do it with honor because we are all in different positions of where we walk. But I want you to see that it's very important that we understand that this was part of the atonement, which is the finished work of Jesus, okay? I want to just uh, speak a blessing over you. Father, I just declare a blessing over each one. As we go out into our schools and our offices and our manufacturing environments, in our communities, in our families, Lord, I pray that this light would shine bright. I pray that you would give us uh, opportunities. Open our eyes to see the opportunities, Lord, to share your goodness, your grace, the good news of Jesus, that we could walk out as living Bibles right before all men. Lord, I just thank you for favor as we go out and throughout our weeks, and just thank you for opportunities that didn't exist until we started praying for them. And, and you are opening our eyes to see him, God. Thank you for blessing in all that we do and touch. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that this message has touched your heart and has brought encouragement to your life. At Believers Christian Church, we're a vibrant, growing body of believers hungry for an authentic walk with our Savior. We want to encourage you to join us this Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Visit us on the web at believerschristianchurch.com.